Okay, so um, welcome everybody to another one of our talks for the Bamboo Lab. Um, we've had uh, a lot of conversations and we've seen a lot of uh, things around bamboo and architecture, bamboo in its ancestral, uh, its ancient ecosystem. We've uh, talked about bamboo and engineering, bamboo and design. Uh, but um, we wanted to include something that looked at bamboo in the wider uh, picture uh, at a global scale and kind of understanding also, um, yeah, the bigger picture of bamboo. And we thought someone like JJ from the Think Bamboo podcast would be ideal to share uh, with, with this group some of these ideas. So we know a lot of people in the world of bamboo and most people are doing stuff like, for instance, building or um, I don't know, creating things. JJ does those things as well. He creates things with bamboo, but he does something else, which is he's connecting the tribe, so to speak. He's, um, he's connecting all the different people around the world that are interested in bamboo and somehow creating a little bit of that kind of um, tribe feeling uh, that I had mentioned around um, the idea of the renaissance of bamboo. We're kind of in a big renaissance and. Somehow JJ is very aware of, of that at, at the global scale and does beautiful work at connecting people uh, throughout the globe. So thank you, JJ, for accepting us, uh, well, our invitation to, to have you as one of the speakers of the Bamboo Lab and over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, super intro. Uh, I'm super excited to be part of this Bamboo Lab here at Ecalva in Colombia, even if it's uh, virtually. <laughs> I can uh, almost feel the, the vibe, very, uh, very cool there, um, I love the, the structure, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely what you said, it's, it's like a, a bamboo renaissance, um, which is kind of happening, um, and um, yeah, the, the Think Bamboo podcast is basically it's, it's inspiration, um, which is um, like the base of, of many things, um, and uh, projects like Ekava, which are unique, which show that bamboo is much more than just a, a plant which grows fast. And thank you very much for this uh, super intro. Uh, I'm super excited to be part of this bamboo lab here at Ecalva in Colombia, even if it's uh, virtually. <laughs> I can uh, almost feel the, the vibe. Very, uh, very cool there. Um, I love the, the structure. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely what you said. It's, it's like a, a bamboo renaissance. Um, which is kind of happening. Um, and um, yeah, the, the Think Bamboo podcast is basically it's, it's inspiration, um, which is um, like the base of, of many things. Um, and uh, projects like Ekava, which are unique, which show that bamboo is much more than just a, a plant which grows fast and so on. So um, let's get this started. Um, here we go. So. Setting bamboo free from misunderstood to limitless regenerative resource with endless use cases. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, um, yeah, we have bamboo, a natural strategic resource for regeneration. This is like the, the presentation uh, overview. So we have like five main uh, topics, and at the end we will have the questions and open discussion. So we're gonna start with the annual market in China and LATAM. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the bamboo market in China is worth an estimated 60 billion US dollar per year. That was back in 2021. <laughs> I mean, this is mind blowing for me. Uh, another interesting aspect there is China itself is the largest consumer of bamboo. They consume about 36 billion of those 60 billion themselves. <laughs> and uh, a third interesting uh, detail here is China 50 years ago, they had zero industry. They started from zero to, to world leading today in 50 years. So basically anybody could could do bamboo if you have like a really uh, a long-term plan and um, it's doable. 
You can't say, oh, just because it's China, they can do it. Everybody can do it. The annual market, bamboo market in Latin America. So I was talking to Inbarlac, it's an international bamboo and rattan organization. And um, I, I got some numbers, not a lot of numbers, but I got the 6 to 8% annual growth of the bamboo market in Latin America. So that's something. Um, then I got like the three, the top three bamboo producing countries in Latin America. No big surprises here. <laughs> Brazil, about 1.5 billion. Colombia, about 140, 150 million. And Ecuador, 25 million. So just from the size of the, of the countries, it makes um, sense that Brazil has the biggest um, market. So we're talking about 2 billion US dollar market a year, which is not bad, <laughs> not comparable to China, of course, but it's not bad. Nine stunning bamboo facts you may know or may not yet know. <laughs> bamboo is not a tree. It belongs to the family of grasses. Some bamboo species can live over 100 years. Um, the, the third one is really my, my personal favorite. So I'm sure most of you are not aware of this one. <laughs> when a living being enters a bamboo forest, the bamboo releases phytochemicals, including the terpene mycin, which is known for its relaxing, sedating effects and reduction, st reduction of stress and anxiety. So basically, the bamboo makes sure that when a person or a animal is entering the bamboo forest, it, 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 it tries to relax them, it relax them um, basically <laughs> to, to, to keep alive. It's a strategy. And this is also uh, one explanation why most people who, who walk into bamboo say, oh, this is interesting, this is like so relaxing, I feel well and all that. It's not just the brain. <laughs> it's it's really it's, it, it it's on a chemical level, so interesting. Fourth, some bamboo species blossom once a lifetime of a human because obviously, if it, some bamboo species can live over a hundred years, <laughs> and uh, let's say uh, best case we 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 make eighty to ninety years for a human. Um, uh, well, it, we also only see once. Uh, uh, like the flourishing of a bamboo, depending on the species, then bamboo is the fastest growing plant on the planet Earth. Several tropical bamboo species can grow up to 90 centimeters in a single day and can reach up to 30 meters height, specifically Dendrocamelus asper and the Dendrocamelus, uh, I think it's Giganteus or something like that. Um, and and they do grow really really fast. It's not continuously the ninety centimeters because you have like this growth phase from zero to four or five or six years until the plant is is mature. But once it's mature and the climate is stable, it's really you can say one meter a day. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, also, generally speaking, there is the clamping bamboo and the running bamboo. All thought. As soon as you go more into details, for example, with uh, Guadua and Guzifolia, you'll figure <laughs> they are uh, running or they are clumping bamboo who run a little bit and they're running bamboo who clump a little bit. <laughs> so um, this is more like uh, just to get a general idea. And um, in, in reality, um, well, uh, the plants, uh, they are uh, not black and white. So... Uh, they do basically uh, what they want. <laughs> and of course, uh, we have uh, the 1,500 uh, different bamboo species. And um, only of the Guadua and Custifolia, specifically, there are several uh, different bamboos. So um, you may or may not know that um, the, there is the Guadua um, Macana, which is like the very straight Guadua. Most architects who, who do classic bamboo architecture like that because it's really very straight. And there, there is, for example, the, the Guadua um, Brava, which has thorns. And it's the same family, just one has 
thorns and is not so straight. And the, the Makana, I think, has thorns, but not so thick one. And so on. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, seven. Bamboo are endemic or native to all continents except Europe. So the exception here is Europe. <laughs> no native bamboo in Europe. <laughs> also, I think the biggest fans of bamboo are from Europe. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> um, bamboo, due to its lower density and, and quicker burning rate while emitting less heat, is considered a preferable option for charcoal production. So basically, this means bamboo charcoal is better than uh, wood charcoal. This is, I think, really a, a killer uh, info, um, thinking of the added value of bamboo. Yeah. Then, as mentioned before, we have about over 1,500 different species of bamboo, which are organized currently in 116 genera. And then you have the families and, and so on. And I, I'm 100% sure there's still quite a few missing. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, another topic I really, truly um, love, which is bamboo as ecosystem service provider. So may maybe some of you will say, what the hell is an ecosystem service provider? Well, <laughs> here we go. So uh, ecosystem service provider basically is um, an ecosystem service refers to the benefits that the humans derive from ecosystem. For example, um, food, water, timber, or bamboo in our case, um, regulating services, for example, climate regulation. So um, helping the, the, the temperature to, um, to stay stable. Um, for example, water purification, which bamboo also does, um, erosion control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we have also the so-called cultural services, like recreational, spiritual value of bamboo, and um, supporting services. Here we have the soil formation with all the microorganisms being very active there, nutrient cycling, and all that. Um, example. Specific examples of bamboo regulation services is the climate regulation, extreme weather, plant bamboo, and you'll have a more stable uh, climate or do um, polyculture, whatever, uh, tropical crops with bamboo, and the bamboo will help you to have a, 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 like a lower little bit temperature and have constant water. So the bamboo obviously slows down the water runoff. Why? Uh, because um, if we have one hectare, of pure bamboo, we have basically a natural water tank. We're talking about um, 40,000 liter of water in that one hectare of bamboo, which, which goes up and down. It's not like a classic water tank where the water is just there. Of course, the, the bamboo like uses the water and, and cleans the water, basically it takes all the, the, the nutrients it needs and, and releases the clean water there. And that per se makes that the, the water slow da slow, slows down, literally. <laughs> then one other example is the biodiversity enhancement. Why? Because bamboo has lots of uh, leaves, has, uh, um, creates lots of um, uh, habitat for uh, biodiversity, specifically birds. Um, we're talking about reptiles, could be snakes, and so on. So this enhances the, the the place then as i mentioned before also erosion control and soil cover super important because most soils today are have uh, erosion control we lo we're losing topsoil uh, we don't have a soil cover and um, another example is the air so uh, bamboo on the average compared to um, the forest produces about 30 percent more oxygen than the average trees more Bamboo ecosystem services facts, not fiction, provided by one of my Think Bamboo podcast guests, Johan Gielis, which um, has been in bamboo for over 30 years. Um, he's more from the scientific um, approach. So um, this has been a, a very interesting podcast with him. So here's some numbers I'd like to share. So bamboo transforms degraded soils and contributes to favorable 
abiotic conditions. So basically, we are we're again we're improving the soil and making the soil viable again thanks to bamboo. Another uh, interesting thing is bamboo is a C4 category plant, and um, thus it can sequester around 200 tons of carbon per hectare. Also, bamboo is highly efficient in water consumption, so it has a very, very low water footprint. Now, why is this interesting? Because if you speak with people about bamboo, they will say, oh, bamboo, yeah, it's nice, but it uses a lot of water. <laughs> so basically, the truth is, no, it doesn't use a lot of water. It's very efficient in water consumption. It has a low water footprint, and it does, um, basically, it cleans the water. So it takes, let's say, it takes 80% of water. And it, it, it gives back 90% of water, something like that. I'm just saying numbers so you get the idea. And um, that's what it does. But it's, it's really low water footprint. Super interesting. Then, as mentioned before, bamboo is a natural water tank. Per hectare, it stores about 40,000 liters of water. Bamboo helps to maintain its own regulation of water and invite the growth of forests, of course. So bamboo is not like um, some other plants where we plant one plant and no other plant will be will allow to, to grow there. No. If when you have bamboo and, and you plant like five by five or six by six meters, so you leave enough space, other endemic plants, trees, flowers will grow between the bamboo. So um, it, 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 the biodiversity uh, is like um, is coming back, and this is quite important because, as we all know, monoculture is absolutely not smart. <laughs> um, then we have bamboo absorbs and recollects harmful natural chemicals like zinc and cadmium. Now, if you think of all the um, mines over the planet Earth. Bamboo is already used in some regions to regenerate those um, those areas where, which are contaminated basically with zinc, zinc and cadmium. Just plant the bamboo there and basically it helps to absorb that. It's a little bit similar to the vetiver grass. Some of you may have heard of the vetiver. Um, so um, vetiver does something similar which is it attracts the microorganism who then break down the chemicals. And this is, I mean, <laughs> this is nature at its best, right? <laughs> They're doing our job. They're regenerating the soil we have damaged. Um, yeah, so um, again, bamboo has shown potential in cleaning up polluted soil. This is probably because of the microorganism that the bamboo attracts. So the, the, if, if you look at um, cell level, the bamboo will attract specific microorganisms who then break down uh, those chemicals. It's, it's highly interesting. Microorganisms in the soil and bamboo roots play a crucial role in nutrient absorption. So again, <laughs> the microorganisms, they're the one doing the magic there, actually. We don't see them. But but they do the magic. <laughs> and bamboo provides shade and limits soil water evaporation, benefiting the microclimate and ecosystem. So this is basically um, from the podcast I did with uh, Johan Gielis. Um, if any of you want to see it, all those podcasts are online. And um, I'll share later the presentation also. Here we have some example about how bamboo enhances fauna biodiversity. So uh, you see three photos there. Um, we see a uh, one of a, a specific, uh, a, a, like a, a toucan. It's not specifically a toucan, but it's from the family of the toucans. We see a snake and we see the um, paradise tanager. And all of them are in the bamboo. So basic, basically, bamboo plays a crucial role supporting and enhancing uh, local biodiversity by providing essential resources to the fauna or the animals, be it the shoots, the leaves, the seeds, and insects serve a significant food source for many species. 
while providing shelter from predators and adverse weather conditions. So um, I've seen a lot of snakes <laughs> like sleep in the bamboo or use the bamboo, the thorns, to get rid of um, uh, ticks or, or things which were on the snake. Um, so this is uh, really interesting. <laughs> and um, yeah, the birds, of course, they use uh, the bamboo, um, the shoots and the leaves for the nesting. They 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 create their own nests. And um, yeah, so I mean, this is like, I highly uh, recommend if you have a place to plant bamboo, plant bamboo, it's, it's really... 360 uh, degrees are uh, going to improve um, like everything, as you see. <laughs> then uh, going more a little bit into the value, because then a lot of people say, okay, JJ, it's good. The birds and the water, it's all nice and all that. But what about money, right? <laughs> so um, with uh, Juan Pablo, we did a, a podcast about the value of ecosystem services, thinking of bamboo. So um, the monetary value, right? Um, because the, obviously today, everything we have to measure with money. So basically, uh, Juan Pablo Martinez um, from um, uh, Central America, <laughs> uh, we discussed this. And this is his presentation. I love how he uh, visualized this. So uh, he did the calculation of each hectare gives you per year. Um, thinking of a polyculture with bamboo, right? So in, in the uh, top image, you see first product is uh, well, it's it's a it's a virtual product, let's say, but it's a product. It's a sequestered carbon, right? Um, so per hectare, it would be 120 tons. The second product um, would be like um, food for one family, so um, enough food to feed one family, and uh, or he says, plus seven goats, or it, it's a, something similar to seven goats. So even um, like animals there. The third product would be like uh, 388 daily wages um, and uh, about 20 cubic meters of wood and 10 tons of biochar and biofertilizer. That's per hectare each year. Pretty interesting, right? Okay, we don't have the value yet. In the second um, screen, we see the value again, one hectare. So I think the 2,900 was the planting. Uh, that's one hectare, the 2,900. I think that's what he calculated um, regarding the value if you have like plants a lot of bamboo there. And the planting unit are like 22 hectares, something like that. And, and and you can basically then say, okay, this would be enough for an, one eco village and so forth. You can you can start um, calculating back and forth, no? Um, so um, quite interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, another number maybe of interest or not, but the value of all the ecosystem services worldwide are estimated to be between 33 and 144 trillion. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the maybe most misunderstood things, uh, the, the ecosystem services. So something to read about and, and to, to try to understand and, and also try to use, um, um, even if it's not yet um, really uh, well understood yet. So, um, regeneration soil with microorganism and bamboo. With Everest from National Bamboo, I recently did a podcast specifically about this. Um, we talked a lot about the microorganism. He explained uh, quite well and also provided those um, images of microorganism, um, how they play a crucial role actually in agriculture, and he highlighted the decline of soil health and, and nutrient density uh, almost everywhere. Um, so um, focusing on, on like enhancing the microorganism with bamboo, we get much better soil. And um, it's about bacteria. It's like the gut bacteria. So some of you may know that fermented foods are super healthy for humans. 
So same thing for the plants. Um, basically, um, you can enhance them with uh, specific um, ferments, and uh, you're basically uh, enhancing, boosting the microorganism there. <laughs> Water use, game changer. One of the most remarkable aspects of bamboo is its water use efficiency. <laughs> Compared to other plants, bamboo is a champion in conserving water. Even in the dry season, bamboo can close its stomata, reducing moisture loss. Such a trait is invaluable in regions facing water scarcity. So I've seen that myself. Um, even with six months of no water, the bamboo will like, it seems like it's sleeping. As soon as the rain comes back, the bamboo uh, starts growing again. The leaves uh, get like lush green again, and everything goes on. It's it's so amazing. On the other side, I've also seen bamboo underwater for six months. We're talking about two, three meters underwater. And after the water is gone, the bamboo again starts just growing again, totally normal. Most plants would not be able to do so. Um, so again, there, bamboo, amazing. Here are some specific uh, uses for food and medicine. This is from Bamboo Leaf Tea, Shanti Pierce. She did this amazing overview. Um, we're not going to go too much in detail, but basically, um, you can use bamboo for plants. Um, you can use bamboo specifically for the soil. We can use the bamboo for the water, as we saw before. We can use bamboo for biodiversity, specifically birds, insects, and so on, and people. So bamboo shots are a superfood. Bamboo has amazing minerals, which also help um, with the cardiovascular, bone density, hair growth, collagen a builder, and uh, also helps to reduce the aluminum in the body in case uh, you have lots of the vaccines, <laughs> for example. Um, now, specifically in regenerative agriculture, um, we have also like, it's just amazing. So we have the food forest, the biomass, silver pasture, where, for example, we have windbreak with bamboo, shade with bamboo, forage uh, the, the whole year around. Um, with the agroforestry, where basically we plant um, bamboo within the food forest, we have food poles, we have windbreak, um, we have carbon sequestration, we have also better uh, water and, and constant climate, so it's not too hot, not too fresh. Syntropic farming, also uh, we can use the bamboo leaf as tea. So I don't know how many of you have tried bamboo leaf tea. It's super good. You just harvest the leaves of the bamboo, cook it five minutes, and you're drinking bamboo leaf tea, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, amazing. Okay. Bamboo raw material for value-added products. This category is specifically meant to, to give a, a like a, an intro into how how broad the bamboo um, use is. So you see some photos there. You see a watch. We see sunglasses. We see beer. We see a Kevlar vest. We see a toilet paper, instruments, a helmet, um, and so on. That it, it's 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 just there is almost no industry where we would not be able to use bamboo. So uh, yeah. So see, uh, another interesting thing is a structural engineered bamboo. So all our architecture friends may have already seen and, and, and um, maybe been talking about this. This is basically, um, uh, well, there are several different ones, structural engineered bamboo. Um, but basically, um, you produce out of the bamboo parts, you produce bamboo beams. So you can build like you would build with wood beams. And because it's bamboo, um, basically it's it's um, talking of um, how the material um, uh, works. It's it's more interesting than wood and metal because obviously it bends uh, a little bit better um, and so on. So this is this is like we're talking here about high tech uh, bamboo use. Of course, you need energy. 
to transform the round bamboo poles into this structural engineered bamboo. But we also need energy if we're going to harvest uh, wood trees, which take uh, 25 years or 40 years to grow, um, or uh, metal beams. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Edible shots. Um, you may or may not have tried the, the baby bamboo, uh, which um, most of them are edible, not all of them. <laughs> you have to cook them two or three times to remove um, all the toxins, um, but very tasty, depending on, on what bamboo you're eating, and super healthy. It's another superfood. Architecture. So <laughs> I'm not going to say a lot about architecture. But um, I just found one interesting um, uh, thing about architecture in uh, Bangladesh, that about 70% of all the, the housing in Bangladesh um, are built in bamboo. And um, this is a lot. <laughs> and, uh, of course, depending where we're from, we don't see a lot of bamboo. But, um, yeah. You being here at Ekava, you you you're, are surrounded by amazing bamboo architecture. So um, as other materials, also you can use uh, bamboo really uh, spectacularly and uh, less spectacularly, <laughs> depending on the mindset of the creators. I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, there are bamboo bridges. So we have in Colombia, we have like. Uh, Guadua Bridge over a highway that's near Bogota. So you see the four car lanes. And on top of that, you have a Guadua Bridge. And another example is this uh, Millennium Bridge at Ibuku in Indonesia. This is over a, a river. Um, those are really amazing examples of um, how you can use bamboo for for real um, serious engineering um, and most people are not aware of it then uh, textile apparel so closing bamboo closing so um, did you know that bamboo fabric is naturally hypoallergenic <laughs> so antibacterial moisture wicking making it an ideal choice for those with sensitive skin so a nice detail isn't it <laughs> And thinking of, uh, instead of the cotton industry, uh, most of you may not know, but the cotton industry is really like kind of, uh, has a lot of challenges. <laughs> so does a little bit the bamboo closing, but compared to the cotton industry, it looks like much better, to be honest. <laughs> bamboo bicycles. Can you imagine that in 1894, uh, the first bamboo bicycle was built. Yeah, there you see a photo. We're talking uh, more than 100 years ago. <laughs> and we're still seeing new bamboo bicycles every day now and more again because we're in this bamboo renaissance um, time right now. So this is, uh, this is highly motivating, actually. The first one was a, um, they were from Austria in Europe. And uh, basically, they were super innovative because uh, I don't know if it was so easy back then to get bamboo. I assume not. <laughs> then talking events, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is a yearly European Bamboo Expo in Germany. Um, and uh, the very first one was two years ago. Um, we focused there on bamboo construction workshop outside of the exposition. Uh, there were like several speaker presentations inside during two days, and there were uh, exhibitors like internationally. Uh, highly interesting. There's a website, European Bamboo EU. Um, if you have the chance um, to go to that expo and, and like exchange ideas with people there, uh, get to know other people, I can highly, um, highly, uh, recommend. Ben, uh, we're already at the questions and open discussion regarding bamboo. Um, so let's go back. You guys still see me? Uh, do you have, your, the presentation is gone, right? Okay. Let's see. Seems like we didn't record it. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's figure something happened. <laughs> 
Uh, what the, okay, what happened here? Let me check. I was in the presentation. The presentation was good. Now I'm checking the software. Software says, didn't get there. That's a quiet, uh, okay, here it says it's still recording. Okay. So we're still recording. Well, whatever. Yeah, let's just uh, <laughs> continue. Let's continue. This is, or should I stop? It says, it says hmm. let's cut here. Let's cut here. Oh, okay. I cannot break. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> it's not responding. I can leave the studio. I will leave the studio and we'll come back for the questions and the open round. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. I'm very sorry. Just go, we just go back to the same link than before. All right. So, um, this would be questions and uh, open discussion regarding bamboo. And maybe we can do a little intro where we are here at Ekava, this amazing, I think it's the open space you guys have at Ekava, um, or one of the first buildings, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, okay, so this is our house. We call it the watershed house. This is where Al, Saskia, and I live. Oh. And uh, oh. we invite a group here today. And normally, normally, you know, there, there's a there's a slightly bigger house which is called Sona House where we have the kind of more the, the the kind of group facilities and this one is our our very own home. Oh, oh so awesome, awesome! I do we see the light coming from top right. Ooh, wow! So wow. The green roof and and the green roof kind of climbs into the house via some big openings in the in the central space and then it's essentially a quite straightforward. Bamboo construction with yeah. poles and <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful we, um... because you're like submerged in, in in nature. From there's like no inside and outside. Exactly, exactly. So it's a lot about making the most of the opportunity of having an architecture that's open. There's no walls, no doors. Um, architecture becomes a very big uh, hat, you can say, a big roof. And uh, the green roof allows for a lot of, um, of um, it's somehow a, a thermal insulator. So this space is actually quite fresh. Although out there, you can probably see there's hot sunshine and it's been a hot tropical day out there. And here it's, it's relatively fresh. And, um, and so we have a kind of more social area uh, up here. And then one goes down steps and we have a whole separate structure, which is the bedroom. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Really, awesome. <laughs> and it's it, it, you put some. I think uh, it's mostly guadua, right, from the farm right there, from the finca. Yeah, guala and gustifolia. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we have some very old bamboo groves, and it's been a joy to to connect with them as a usable material, but also to expand them. Yeah. And a lot of what you showed us today is very inspiring as well for what you know things to come like we really see a, a, a huge potential in expanding the bamboo groves and kind of regenerating what you here exactly in this valley where we are there used to be something like 50 hectares of bamboo groves and now it's down to probably two or three hectares over the last 50 years wow. it's been you know down and we kind of want to bring it up again to those uh, high levels of, of like many, many hectares of bamboo groves right here in this, in this valley. That would be awesome if you guys are able. I'm happy also to, to, to try to help. I have some ideas, some contacts maybe, which may um, later uh, be of, of any use, um, like parallel thing. Um, because this is like, I mean, from 2 to 50 is like quite some work and organization and uh, yeah. yeah yeah we we've we've been on a big learning process and and it's still a, a project in the future like we've started and we've actually shared with the group that's here for the bamboo lab our current efforts and also our lessons and there's still yeah a lot of work ahead to be able to get there to a, you know a, a consolidated large scale bamboo grove of of, of many hectares mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, but I mean, you guys are doing amazing stuff in, in so short time also. I mean, uh, that's another detail, right? <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're big fans of you as well and your work. Well, thank you. I'm just trying to to inspire other people with amazing work from from others, mostly. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, let's get more people using bamboo, right? So, um, yeah. You guys have any um, like specific questions or or things which uh, you want to like add regarding the this general bamboo presentation? Maybe. Hi there. Good morning. Do you hear JJ? Um, a little bit. Yeah, just. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I... I want to go closer, maybe. Yeah, please. Well, I can copy the computer. I've heard. I know what yeah, it better. Someone told me the story that when you take like a a piece of bamboo to to plant it somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, the big bamboo, the uh, uh, cultivo, uh, uh, grove, grove, where you take it, mm -hmm. and if you take it to another place of the world, and if it dies. Mm -hmm. The bamboo plantation that you took with you will also die. Is that true? Have you heard of anything about that? I don't know if I may, you understand. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, it's it's about the DNA basically of the bamboo plant. So um, um, basically, <laughs> it has to do. It, it's a bit complex, maybe, but um, it's a good question. <laughs> so um, basically. Each bamboo has like an own lifespan. We're talking about 70 or 140 years lifespan, right? So the bamboo grows. And after those 140 years, for example, in, in the longest living um, example, it will flourish. And then it dies. And then all the seeds that has, uh, have flourished like before will grow again within the next four or five years. But all the bamboo being from that species will die before the other grow. So um, I think that has to do with the question you, you mentioned before, right? Yeah, I think so. No, it was a story I heard once and I didn't really understand how it worked because uh, someone said that if I take a bamboo from Asia and bring mm -hmm. it to Colombia and mm -hmm. the bamboo in Asia dies, my bamboo will also die. So Yeah, this has to do with the DNA. Basically, in the DNA, the, the, it's not so... Well, it has to do with, ideally, we would know when the flowering of the bamboo was, which we're planting. So we know this bamboo I'm planting will, uh, has flourished, like, let's say, 30 years ago, and it has a lifespan of, let's say, 140 years. So 30 minus 140 uh, equal uh, the time the bamboo will live, right? Because okay. they have... Their time, like us humans, let's say we have between 60 and 90, we live, right? <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> and the bamboo is the same thing. Depending what bamboo, they have longer or shorter lifespan. Okay, thank yeah. you. So if you get a bamboo, for example, from Asia or, or seeds, try to get the information if the pe a person selling it or giving it to you knows how, how, how or when the bamboo flourished, that will help you to understand um, and, and research how long it takes until it flourishes again. But basically, just think about this. Uh, uh, the bamboo uh, uses this technique to basically to, to restart the system, right? Um, because uh, being grass, it, it probably could grow endlessly, but maybe that would not be healthy. That's why it has like a restart after so and so many years where it flourishes, it puts all those seeds around and then all this bamboo, which has lived for so long, just dies and the seeds, which uh, catch uh, enough uh, growth, they grow again. And then there is even probably more bamboo, but we have to wait between four and six years until that seed bamboo is again a mature bamboo. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. It's it's at the beginning. I think it's it's kind of complex to to understand. Also because the knowledge of bamboo is there is some knowledge there, um, but I I would dare to say it's it's not quite everything there, and and, and the knowledge is not um, it's not black and white either. So there is some ancestral knowledge. And there is some scientific knowledge, and it's not always, <laughs> it doesn't always totally match, you know? <laughs> but that makes it interesting. Yeah, JJ, I have another question. Yes, please. It's really a question that 
we hear from a lot of people that we speak with in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, in Europe, in the UK, in places like that, there are many, many uh, bamboo fans. And yet bamboo is not um, indigenous to the European continent. Yep. Um, and I've heard you speak about things like the Bamboo Expo in Germany, and there's a bamboo planting, a huge bamboo planting project in Portugal that you've mentioned to us and things like that. Yeah. Uh, what would be your advice to people in Europe who are passionate about bamboo, Europe, UK, uh, you know, in those kind of uh, seasonal climates in the Northern Hemisphere? Um, what what would you advise to, I don't know, young architects or other people interested in working with bamboo in those climates? Um, yeah, what would be your advice for them? Well, uh, I would, I would do, if I, if I would be able, I would do world tour. <laughs> I would go to LATAM. I would go to Asia and try to learn to understand how, how those places uh, make use of bamboo today and in the past and what's happening there. And then at the end, I will go to Europe. I will go to um, uh, Portugal, where uh, you have the huge bamboo plantation. I will go to Greece, where others are starting also bamboo plantations. I will go to France, where um, the state is kind of sponsoring you if you plant bamboo. Um, also in, I think, um, Belgium, the same situation. So people are starting to or like farmers are starting to diversify. Um, let's say they have, uh, I don't know, let's say 50 hectares of classic crops like corn and uh, uh, potatoes and stuff like that, right? And now they're starting with one and two and three and four and five hectares with bamboo between their crops. So this is highly interesting, but it has a lot to do with politics too, because of course, uh, labor is expensive, machines are expensive, we're talking about Europe, it's a different climate and all that. Um, yeah, but, but it, it, I think it would help if, if the person is, has the possibilities to travel, I would really do LATAM, I would go to Asia because both have very different realities. Um, and you have a lot of international, let's say, um, architects who have done um, uh, 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 like a broad different uh, buildings with bamboo, which also help to, to, to open the mind out of this classic, like let's say, modern architecture or, or whatever. I mean, when you're in Asia, you can go to China. They have so much uh, stuff ongoing there, also with the uh, timbers, uh, like structural uh, timber bamboo. They're doing now uh, houses with, they just did a house with six floors um, with a, a SEB, with a structured engineered bamboo. I mean, six floors, you know, bamboo. Wow, <laughs> amazing. And in Europe they did, I think, six floors, a tall house with a timber. So. Things are changing and it's getting interesting because um, if you look at the footprint, the water footprint, carbon footprint, energy footprint, all there for sure, bamboo is the king. And all the others are, are somewhere low, very low, <laughs> like really low down. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, JJ, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I can't see you. Um, maybe you can... Hi there. How are you, JJ? My name I'm is great. Gregory. How are you? Great to see you, Gregory. I'm happy to be here with you guys. <laughs> You're so cool. I'm going to listen to your podcast on my next flights. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, so, is this too loud? Is this loud enough? Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, say I go to Donstadt in Germany. Are they? To, I hear you talking about structural engineering. Is anybody? Is anybody selectively breeding bamboo for a seasonal northern climate? First part of my question. Second part, are there any genetic uh, engineering experiments along the same line? Maybe not even just for different seasons or different areas, but for different uses. For instance, in a lot of cases, we use a lot of ethanol derived from maize. Mm -hmm. Is there anything similar like in the world of bamboo? Is, is anybody in Germany talking about that when I go? Uh, specifically, not specifically, but um, basically to the first question, um, 
I, I do have an answer. <laughs> so um, if you think of... You would, JJ. Thank you. <laughs> if you think of, of bamboo, um, the, one of the trick is to find the bamboo that grows in the climate, right? Now, um, you may have seen photos of bamboo in China, bamboo forest covered with like half a meter and a meter of snow, right? Um, so basically, we're talking there about a endemic Chinese uh, philostachys, uh, mosul bamboo, which uh, very well is adapting right now in, uh, in um, Portugal. So I don't think Portugal has lots of snow, <laughs> but <laughs> still it's, it's the one they have growing, as, as, as I know, in um, Portugal and in France. In Greece, I think um, they planted something different. Um, regarding genetics, now specifically, um, uh, there are some bigger organizations who, who are like um, reproducing bamboo on a lab scale. So with the pipette, really, like they can reproduce uh, thousands of bamboo per day, um, ten thousands. Uh, I don't have. I have another podcast um, with um, one of them from Indonesia, and we have the numbers there. I can't remember it, but it's like amazing, because manual reproduction of bamboo is slow, to be honest. So you want like lab reproduction. But your question was regarding genetics. Now. Um, there is some people are uh, working or playing around with genetics. <laughs> um, I'm aware of that, but not specifically now in in, in Germany at all, because uh, in Germany they have their, the politics is is not about planting bamboo. It's specifically, as I know, it's Portugal, France, um, and um, and and Greece. So uh, it's, it's a very political thing right now in Europe. Um, as soon as they run out of uh, uh, timber wood or, or they, they start uh, like measuring how much uh, the carbon footprint and, and energy footprint is of the wood, maybe they'll, they'll have more pressure to use more bamboo. <laughs> Are you saying there's, there's a lot of different politics in Europe? This is mind blowing to an American. Yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank I, you. In Florida, I know also, speaking of the U.S., uh, in, in Florida, um, they're planting giant bamboo on an industrial scale. Um, uh, it's more of a monoculture. But, of course, the climate is, is, is like uh, semi-humid there, so it works well. Um, and uh, it's on a large scale. But, yeah, uh, politics is a rather sad topic nowadays. <laughs> So let's stick to the bamboo. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, no, but it's, it's actually genetics. Also thinking of uh, uh, your, your question, it's an interesting thing because um, we're right now, we're more, more focusing on like trying to grow local bamboo, like thinking of the European, right? Um, and the European also like would like to use more of the guadua, so the Latin American bamboo. But most uh, it's easier to to import the Chinese bamboo right now because they have this huge industry. So Latin America is not yet there. Um, we don't have this industry uh, also because of China because they produce the machines, <laughs> they produce the bamboo, and uh, they're well organized and have like really a, a clear uh, vision and mission uh, regarding bamboo where they want to go right. And Latin America is not yet is a little bit um, um, not so well organized, let's say, <laughs> in this regard. <laughs> um, but has amazing potential, of course, here too, because uh, there is one guy in Colombia, he has, um, he's, I think, Belgium, but he is planting bamboo like crazy there, and he planted tons of also Asian bamboo in Colombia and Chinese bamboo, and it's growing, you know? It's growing. It grows. <laughs> bamboo is one of the plants which really adapts almost everywhere. Unless you're doing like the, 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 the cold weather bamboo in the, in the desert or the other way around, which would not make sense, of course. But it adapts in super poor soil. It adapts in, in like uh, climate, in extreme climate with lots of uh, rain and, and, and almost no rain. So um, it, it's highly adaptable. Um, 
Yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, yes. Hello, thanks for the thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a quick question, just on the same topic. And um, as you were saying about mixing, taking a bamboo from Asia and growing it in South America, or taking bamboo from well South America and trying to grow it in Europe. And I was wondering, maybe there's studies, and maybe is there any issues that that's causing in terms of the ecosystems? The established ecosystems have been introduced, uh, or maybe an alien uh, species. Because I, I believe in England, uh, bamboo is causing a bit of problems because the uh, the uh, decorative de, de or what's the word, the aesthetic ornamental, ornamental bamboo grows that people had uh, planted in their gardens have escaped and causing a bit of ha havoc in. It's in a the, good uh, point. Well, yeah. if you plant running bamboo, for example, in, in your garden, which is, let's say, 50 square feet, and, and you have another neighbor, like, uh, let's say, uh, 10 meters away, maybe it's not the smartest thing to do, right? Now, there, there is clumping bamboo also for, uh, uh, like, cold weather. Um, uh, most of the clumping bamboo is, is tropical, but not all of it. And most of the running bamboo is, like, for colder weather. But uh, there are other techniques where you can like uh, uh, build like um, like fencing inside of the soil for the bamboo so it can't escape. <laughs> so you're controlling the bamboo. <laughs> um, and a, a lot of things um, regarding the other question, it's, it's a, a, almost a philosophical question. If you think of introducing things from other places, because I mean, on, on one side, Everything we know today or we're using today has been introduced from somewhere. For example, potato comes from Peru. And in Europe, I know many countries where if you have no potato, uh, people uh, wouldn't know what to eat nowadays. <laughs> and maybe before uh, uh, the Europeans uh, uh, officially um, uh, found uh, Latin America, uh, I, we don't know anymore what they ate. They had other food. And for example, the chicken comes from India. And everywhere now we have chicken. And it's like the number one cheapest food, like meat food, uh, around the world, right? But it's, it's from India. Um, same thing with the horses. Uh, we have horses everywhere. Uh, basically, I think most of the horses come from uh, the, the Arab region. Um, and, and then they've been like breeding and stuff like that. Same thing with the dogs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Pigeons um, and a lot of other stuff, like for example, the English grass, like the, the uh, el pasto, same thing. It's like everybody wants to have a, a mini golf a grass in, on their front yard, <laughs> but does it, <laughs> does it make sense? Is it smart? Um, I would say, Probably in that specific situation, no, there are better um, uh, solutions um, for soil cover because basically what you're doing with the grass is soil cover. So it depends, back to your question, it depends a little bit what do you want to achieve? What's your goal? Uh, do you want bamboo for aesthetics? Are you planting it in, in, like, uh, in your apartment, in your garden, or, or somewhere outside? Um, how big, how tall uh, is it allowed to grow? What species is it going to be? Because we're talking about a, a universe of 1,500 different species. The smallest bamboo is about this tall. It's a, a, a nano. It's a, it's a dwarf bamboo. And the tallest bamboo is 30 meters. And it's the same. It's, it's bamboo. It's a bamboo family. So... <laughs> it's like the humans, right? We come in every color and size, and and and, and some are smart and and some not, and some speak a lot and and some not, and etc. Right? So some have lots of hair and other have no hair. <laughs> the same thing with the bamboo. Um, so I think it is possible. It is something to think about. And, and do good research regarding current issues, regarding how legal it is, in the example of England, for example, um, 
because of the density, for example, of people living together, you don't have, want to have issues with your neighbors. Neighbors are super important. <laughs> they live around you and you live around them. So basically they're your environment, <laughs> like uh, uh, literally. <laughs> um, and um, it, it's about researching and really thinking um, how can I use, it's about first knowing what can the bamboo do, right? And, and, and thinking, like, re-thinking, um, uh, like, with the knowledge you guys have right now regarding bamboo, you know 99% more than most people. You know that there are, like, so many um, um, things that bamboo uh, affects positively. Of course, there are always issues. One issue, for example, guadua thorny bamboo, go and harvest that and... Show me your fingers after that, right? <laughs> it's going to be really, uh, it's going to be ugly because they're like four to two th centimeters long thorns and, and, and it's not nice. <laughs> so they're always both sides, right? Um, but um, I mean, you can wear gloves and you can try to cut them and etc. So it's all about managing it and, and try to, um, you try to know what you do and, and, and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Ricardo. Ricardo again. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just had a question. Um, I, I have been studying hemp for about five years, mm -hmm. and all all the things that uh, all the things that you have said, I see it as well in that plant. So just to know about like what is your opinion or how if I want to make a sharp of comparison between hemp and bamboo, what mm -hmm. would you say? Because I'm I'm just learning about bamboo, and if I have to make a table about the both of them, how would you say, like, what are the main difference between them, or what are the, the main similarities between them, no? Like, because for me, all that you say bamboo is, is the kind of uh, equal to, to hemp, no? So, yeah, that's yeah. my question. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, my knowledge in hemp is, is uh, quite uh, limited uh, compared to my low knowledge in bamboo. Um, um, and also hemp for me is, is kind of a bit technical because you have like the THC hemp and the one without THC, right? Which was used like historically for ropes and uh, there was like a huge industry for that. And then also because of uh, political uh, situation and, and, and business, uh, they like made the hemp with has, which has THC illegal. And now depending on where you are and... Uh, you need like a license or you can only use the one without THC and all that. So um, from the legal uh, uh, reality, I think hemp is a little bit more uh, technical, right? Than bamboo where um, I think it's, it's, it's much more legal uh, broadly, also available. Uh, we're talking um, hemp is also like more like a, a, a typical, I think, plant. Um, how, how tall does hemp get? Like three meters, something like that. It does restore the soil. It does have many uh, interesting aspects, also on um, health, of course. Um, um, but it, it it doesn't get. I don't think it gets over uh, four to five meters tall, if like maximum or or, or so. Um, regarding building material in specific, um, yeah, you could. You could probably do the, the hemp house with some uh, also um, um, like um, transform or you could use hemp like almost naturally or transform hemp for uh, insulation, for construction, fire reduction and all that. So um, ideally you would do like a, a mix of uh, bamboo and, and hemp, each one of them depending on their uh, best uh, strength probably like like bamboo using the poles having their flexibility and, and and that and the hemp maybe for fire reduction um where i think bamboo <laughs> does burn very well <laughs> so <laughs> that's not a comparable <laughs> um uh, yeah um thinking of food the hemp also is highly uh, medical um, I don't know if it has silica as bamboo too. Probably it has other chemical um, ingredients. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Is your question like more general or more for construction or more like in case of like uh, planting or using it in, in like a polyculture? In, in on what like from what perspective, Ricardo, is your, your question? I think it was more general, but that now that you say, I think I was thinking more about the agricultural parts, like the thing, like growing, no? Like, can you grow hemp and bamboo uh, at the same time? Because the two of them grow very fast. The difference is one is four months, the other one is six years. And like, but also like, can you do like permaculture design with bamboo inside? Like, or for, I think you put some charts like a forest, um, yeah. like, I don't know, you can put like tr fruit trees, like inside the bamboos, nothing like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the thing so, is basically with bamboo and hemp, for example, the hemp, I, I'm not sure, I think it's three to four meters. We're talking about height. So basically... Ale has been six meters. Okay, six meters. So six meters. So the big difference there, thinking of fruit forests, is um, depending on your crop. Uh, uh, for example, if you're growing a classic coffee, it needs this much amount of, of, of sun, right? Direct sunlight. Um, and the coffee plant, if, if you crop it, you're going to keep it like two to maximum three meters tall, right? Now, if you do um, shade coffee, you want shade. So um, you need something which is taller than the three meters because you want to create some shade for the coffee. Um, so it depends a little bit on the, um, on the, the polyculture you're going to grow how much shade or, or direct sunlight it needs. Um, also, I don't know how much sunlight that the hemp plant needs. I think they do need quite some sunlight. I don't think they will grow below shade. Or how is that, Ricardo? If you want it for construction, you need a lot of sun. Okay, so sun makes them grow faster, stronger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so... There you would have to consider basically maybe if you use bamboo, use it like um, like on the sides or or like like 20 or 30 meters away from the hemp, you know, and um, and like that, where you create like different zones within the, the polyculture, but don't plant the hemp then like too near to the bamboo because of the topic of, of the bamboo is going to absorb most of the direct sunlight and it's going to create a new ecosystem which is about 10 to 15 degrees fresher than where you do not have the bamboo. Okay, okay. Um, it's going to help with the water. So I understand hemp is not a C4 class. So I think hemp consumes a little bit more water than bamboo. I'm not sure about that. Maybe you have some information there in the vegetation part it, it does but it, it has some is it helps the the roots helps a lot because it can go like two three to four meters down like it can yeah go down very down yeah but i don't know precisely the number of, of liters that it needs for the growth yeah maybe one thing which could be interesting if you're thinking of polyculture agriculture setup use hemp use bamboo, maybe not the giant bamboo, maybe um, some guadua or some smaller bamboo and add the vetiver grass because the vetiver grass will, will uh, highly en enhance the nutrients in the soil, has like um, six to 12 meters of, of roots. So really lots of roots and it's just two meters tall. Um, and the vetiver grass helps to, to boost the soil. So you want a healthy soil, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Have you, have you heard about vetiver? No, I haven't. It's a great uh, thing. Check it. Vetiver, vetiver grass, really. I, I don't know if you have at Ekava vetiver, but it's, if, if you can get your hands on vetiver seeds, normally it's a live seed. You plant and then you reproduce from the same plant. It really, it's, it's, it's magical for poor soils. And uh, I've used that and bamboo, um, those two together, because the vetiver grass within one year, it's boosting. The bamboo needs like the four to six years to really be mature, of course, because it's a huge, a huge grass. Three grasses in one. The, with the system, no? the vetiver, the hemp, and the bamboo, there are three grasses. Is hemp considered a grass too? Yeah, it's a grass. Oh. It's a grass. 
That's cool. In between a plant and a grass, and it's uh, and it can be in the same plant. You can have female and, and male. Male. Yeah. yeah. So it can reproduce itself as many times as it wants. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's another world. The whole hemp hemp thing. But it's interesting. It's also grass. Yeah. Yeah. So add if you think agriculture, polyculture. Um. Um. Think about vetiver if you can get your hands on it. It's from India, by the way. <laughs> But uh, it works everywhere where you have this tropical thing. It, it has lots of positive things too. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, for example, if you have a neighbor who's uh, um, like setting fire on his land, the vetiver grass will stop the fire because it has oils in there and those oils will like slow down the fire and the fire will stop where the vetiver is. Uh, vetiver grass is the number one raw uh, ingredient needed for the uh, perfume industry because it's so strong and those, this strong thing attracts the nutrients. You want the nutrients in the soil to, to, to be like a highway. Think of a highway. <laughs> but instead of cars, you have the microorganism going up and down, uh, bringing the nutrients, bringing minerals and all this thing. That's the best soil you can get. And in, in such a soil, you can grow uh, food trees, you can grow bamboo, and everything uh, grows uh, better again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jay. You're very welcome, Ricardo. Well, I have one more question, and I wonder if there's any other question. We're probably reaching the kind of end. But um, the, the, the last question I had was, you mentioned something around environmental services and the economy of environmental services. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that might listen to you or in your podcast, or I can think of loads of people in Colombia now that are passionate about bamboo, might be think about regenerating a bamboo grove, things like that. And what, what um, possibilities are there out there that you can know of that uh, are like funds that, that, that might help people that want to regenerate bamboo groves or, or create bamboo groves. Yeah. Are you aware of these programs? Are they easy to apply to? Is it quite a complex kind of uh, territory? Um, do you need a, a scale? Like, do you need like a thousand hectares to, 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 to be eligible for these things? Like, yeah, what's your uh, knowledge of this kind of panorama? Okay, that's a, a great question. <laughs> um, Basically, from my knowledge, um, in speaking of LATAM, not Europe, Europe is a bit different because every country has its very specific politics. And for example, in France, uh, the government will help you. In Belgium, it's like this and et cetera, et cetera. So, but we're here in LATAM. So in LATAM, in Latin America, um, it's more like uh, organizations or, or, or business which, um, which apply this... Um, uh, right now, so um, we're thinking, we're talking about um, uh, business which are focusing on reforestation and then on thinking on um, uh, carbon sequestration and um, uh, regenerating uh, forests and and trying to uh, create value out of that. Right. So um, those organizations are mostly. Um, uh, funded by uh, investors, so they have to seek for investors, so people who want to put money and, and, and uh, basically um, earn more money out of that. Yeah, so um, there is like out of, I mean, ideally you could like apply and say, hey, we're doing, uh, we're improving the soil again, uh, we're uh, regreening uh, the place, we're uh, improving the river again because we have no more erosion, we're planting bamboo, um, please, some monies, some bamboo, <laughs> but uh, uh, sadly, um, no, uh, because also <laughs> most don't understand really what bamboo is. So uh, let's talk about uh, WWWVVF or, or Greenpeace or all those big organizations. Um, I think they, the bamboo, they don't have bamboo yet on their radar, you know? Um, uh, so um, it's, it's not yet there. Um, but I mean, hey, I'm interested if, if uh, there are any ideas there, how we can like gain their attention 
and um, and see what we can do. Um, help people uh, uh, like ask for grants, for example, regarding bamboo, um, regarding specific bamboo uh, grows projects in in Latam, for example. That would be so amazing. That would like boost the use of bamboo because it would simplify things. Right now, basically, you have to fund that yourself. And it's not just the funding. One challenge is the money. The other challenge right now is where do I get the bamboo seeds? <laughs> if I grow them myself, I need a minimum time span of about three to six months where I harvest the bamboo, I, I cut the seedlings which have the nodes, I put them in the bags with the soil, I create some uh, root, um, root enhancer from sugar and whatever, and, and then I hope that I get about 80% or whatever of, of those to grow, right? So we're talking about energy, we're talking about time, and of course uh, also you need, you need the money to do that. And that's the plants. The plants is, I don't know how the situation is in Colombia or in other places, but it's, it's a tricky part and it's a key part of planting bamboo. We need the plants. <laughs> and it's not that easy. Now, if I have a plant somewhere or you have a plant in Colombia and you want to send it to Panama, it's going to be like, oh, but you have to pass the aduana. <laughs> and uh, it's going to get complicated. <laughs> So um, there also, this would be great if, if all the bambuceros, if, uh, if we work together and say, hey, I'm in this region, I have this, or I can send you those seeds, you can send me this seed, seeds exchange, for example, um, or ways how to propagate bamboo faster, for example. I've seen some videos of people, specifically in Colombia, uh, just cutting the guadua, the entire trunk, just putting it in the soil, uh, putting some soil on top of it, coming back four months later, and you see like five heads <laughs> of, of the guadua, then cutting them and planting them apart. I mean, that's pretty cool if that works, right? Of course, that's possible if the soil is really like good soil, <laughs> and probably if the bamboo is not too old, and you need the knots where then the, the, the bamboo will grow, which is then in the soil. And you need the, the good specific amount of humidity within the bamboo. So not too humid, but not too dry. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think that's been a, a really... Okay, I think we have one more question. Any other awesome. question? Okay, we have one more question. JJ, one question. You have been, let's say, exploring this world of bamboo, and one thing that always concerns me is like the maintenance of bamboo. Yeah. I know when you build in bamboo, one of the most important things is to have a good roof to protect it from rain and sun. But have you gone into that world to know how, which is the best way, or who has explored much more, like uh, how can be bamboo being uh, protected? There's in the construction because yeah. we okay. recently saw a conversation uh, from an architect, from an engineer, and he mm -hmm. said, no, uh, this structure needs uh, maintenance every year with uh, uh, with an oil and with honey, with honeybee thing. Okay, that's a great question uh, regarding construction and preservation of bamboo once the structure is built, correct, right? Yes, okay. So, <laughs> uh, again here, it's not black and white. Why? Because, for example, if you think in Latin America specifically, and we go back 150 years in time, we have bamboo construction, right? People used bamboo, and it did survive for 50, for 100 years, or even 150 years. So basically, um, um, it was possible back then to build something that lasted three generations or depending on uh, just a long time, 150 years, right? <laughs> How did they achieve that? Do you have any ideas? Maybe. The moon harvesting. Bingo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Exactly. So um, the, the people, uh, our ancestors before, they had this uh, great thing uh, where they looked at the moon and knew, oh, we are in uh, July, we have now our window 
of opportunity of five days where we can harvest the bamboo because it's full of water and during this and this hour of the day, it's the best time to harvest the bamboo because it have even more water during that time of the day, during those few days of the months, during the specific months of the year, thinking of summer and winter. Now, why is this um, possible? If you think of um, the, I don't know how it's called in, in English, but um, basically the moon affects the water, right? Um, when you're at the coast, you see how the, the water moves uh, at night um, the further away, or in the river also when you're near the, the, the coast, right? The water moves. And the same thing happens with the bamboo, with all the plants, basically. Um, even it's relevant for your nails or your hair or whatever. So if you want longer hair, you, have, you should cut them ideally when the moon is in the right uh, uh, place and you have like a window of, of time of a few days every month. <laughs> and it's the same thing with bamboo. Now, if you cut it there, you still have to dry the bamboo because it's full of water. <laughs> it will be even more uh, full of, of water than when you cut it at any other day, right? So um, you always have to dry the bamboo, ideally eight weeks or more. Once the bamboo is dry, um, there are several uh, um, techniques to additionally enhance the bamboo. So there is like, uh, you submerge a bamboo in a, a salt water um, a mix, um, depending what is available, of course. Some people, in some places on the planet, they just submerge it in the, in, in the sea, because the sea is salt water, you know? El mar. <laughs> like for uh, uh, four weeks or one week. Uh, there are like really a lot of different um, uh, options there. Others put them in a giant oven and cook the bamboo. <laughs> so we're talking about 20 meter long oven where you cook the bamboo poles and basically uh, any uh, organism who's in there and any sugars, it breaks down because it gets cooked. Basically, the, the big uh, challenge there is what? The bamboo, if you harvest it, not according to the moon, you'll have sugars in there. Why do you have sugar in the bamboo? Because the bamboo needs energy. It grows super fast, so it has lots of sugar. <laughs> sugar is the fuel of the bamboo, right? So um, that's good. We want the bamboo to grow, right? <laughs> but then, of course, we don't want the bamboo to deteriorate. And here is the tricky thing. We don't want the sugars to be in the bamboo. Now, when the bamboo is full of water, there is very little or almost no sugar there. That's why harvesting in, in, in the best moon makes it so much better. And, and that's what they used, like what our ancestors used before. And, and this knowledge has been like almost forgotten. <laughs> almost. <laughs> but here we are talking about it in 2024. <laughs> so, um, yeah. This is a, a very interesting topic, and um, I always have to go on the internet to, to really research uh, what are the best days, specifically where you are, because where you are on the planet Earth, depending if you're in the south or in the north, um, will be different according to the moon and all that. Um, so uh, there is some research there, but um, it, it makes sense. And um, I would really um, recommend to have a look at it, of course, on an industrial scale, if you build a huge bamboo thing and you need like, let's say, more than 1,000 bamboo poles, it's gonna get complicated. <laughs> but uh, for uh, smaller structures, um, I've built structures which have survived over eight years like that. I've put uh, nothing on top of it in tropical region. We have termites, we have everything there. The bamboo's still there, my wood, is uh, almost gone, but the bamboo is still there <laughs> because I did harvest it on the on the right uh, time. So um, yeah, this could be one natural solution. And of course, on the on the uh, modern solutions with oils or uh, gasoline or uh, um, there are like lots of other solutions there. Even in Japan, there is an amazing solution where they burn the bamboo. Literally, they burn the bamboo with a flame. It gets carbonized, but just the top part of it around, right? 
and and thus um, it, it 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 closes this bamboo. Um, that's a, a Japanese technique. I don't remember the name, but um, this helps also. Just don't burn it too much because then you have a charcoal, right? <laughs> that's a, yeah. Uh, there are many options. Um, bamboo preservation really super important uh, topic. If you want to seriously build with bamboo, why? Because if you take the energy, the time, and build something, you want it to survive the maximum of time. And as you said before, we need roof, yes. But we also need to be sure that the, eventually any sugars which are in the bamboo uh, are not there once we build the structure because this is going to be like a food source for all the insects, for all the termites, for all the little hungry uh, um, uh, animals, insects there, which uh, can enter the bamboo and will start to eat the bamboo, of course, because they are hungry. <laughs> right, thank you. You're welcome. Well, JJ, it's been a real pleasure to, to have this conversation, to have your presentation and have this Q&A. We're really, really grateful that uh, you made time to be with us today. And we look forward to having many more uh, conversations in the future. Thank you so much, Sergio. Also, um, uh, for me to be here, this has been exciting to, to share, inspire, and, and, and share some info from other podcasts mostly. <laughs> and I continue to learn. Today, I learned some things about hemp also. So this is uh, always a win-win ideal, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and... Um, Looking forward, um, I will share this uh, presentation and those questions in a blog post and on, uh, of course, YouTube, Think Bamboo, and on the website, Think Bamboo. Uh, and um, I don't know if you want to share some words about the, the workshop you're having right now at ICAVA in Colombia, maybe. Uh, just a few sentences, if you like to uh, share. I think this is like you started already a few days ago, right? Yeah, so we call it the Bamboo Lab. We're based in, a, in, in the San Blas Valley in Colombia. Uh, our whole project, the whole territory is called Ikawa. And the Bamboo Lab is uh, something that was, um, had been evolving over the years. We're in generation five of the Bamboo Lab, and this is generation five. <laughs> and over the years, uh, we started first, uh, um, let's say, or with our passion for bamboo and our passion for architecture, both Al and I are architects, and, and we had a, um, a real passion to build with bamboo and create sculptural architecture. And we also felt a calling to open that process and, and have a shared experience, have a, have a, have a space of co-creation where like-minded people from around the, the world could, could come together and, and build together something beautiful and and exchange um, energy, exchange information, exchange, uh, well, and, and share, you know, share in all sorts of ways around the, 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 the let's say, a, a creation of a, of a small community, you could say, over a few weeks. And um, um, there's, let's say, in addition to a whole, let's say, aspect of it, which is the co-creation of a structure in bamboo, uh, we, there's also a whole other kind of stream in, uh, which is, people that are, or all the participants kind of bringing their own design ideas and developing design ideas around the world of, uh, or the, 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 the material of bamboo and, and kind of hopefully uh, feeling empowered to move out into their own lives, their own, uh, you know, um, home uh, countries or wherever it is that they, that they want to, to create in the future and to allow these beautiful ideas around bamboo sculptural architecture sculptural form to to you know to imbue their their you know the future of of humanity really wherever that may that may awesome awesome so uh, this is ongoing like uh, we're in the middle of the bamboo lab right now um so it's a three week uh this generation five was a three week it is a three week uh, uh let's say process and we're kind of yeah We've begun week number three. And okay. Actually, on Saturday is a big culmination. We have a big celebration. We've invited a community of friends and like-minded people from around the region, all the way to 
the big city that's Medellin, which is probably three hours away from here. So we expect a, you know, a nice gathering of like-mindedness to celebrate what we've created over the Bamboo Lab. Beautiful. So I, I hope you guys are going to uh, continue to have an amazing time there and, and hope you have a great celebration. And uh, all the best and let's stay in contact and plant bamboo. Okay. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.